Hello and welcome to the Mike and Mike podcast, uh, wherever you are and however you may be joining us, we appreciate the fact that you're here tuning in with us as we go through really in this series that we've been uh, biblical examples that we can learn from um, successful um, business people throughout the course of the Bible that we can try to learn what they did well, what they did wrong, and how we can implement those business principles and strategies into our lives so that we can be successful. Um, joining me always is my esteemed colleague, Mr. Ray. How's everything in Somerset this morning, brother? It's beautiful, my friend. Thank you for asking. As 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 always, we will add the uh, the, the disclaimer. You know, these are these are primarily spiritual uh, lessons. Uh, but if we're going to try to uh, be godly in our business lives, there's no reason that we can't apply them. Uh, the way that these these uh, Bible business people applied them, and, and and as we'll see today, some for the better and some for the worse, because sometimes it's uh, it's even more useful to learn from a bad example. And I think I think maybe that's where we're headed today. Yeah, and uh, and at times, um, I think in uh, in the business world, the autopsy we can learn a lot more from um, from the failed business. Uh, anybody that that has had some of those uh, higher level business classes uh, remembers things like the Etzel and how uh, terrible of a, of a <laughs> vehicle that was and kind of the autopsy of it. And, and this morning, we're going to try to do that with, with Laban. Um, so, Michael, for our uh, not up to date uh, Old Testament scholars here that are listening to us, uh, tell us a little bit about who Laban is and how he fits in the, uh, in the grand scheme of things. So, so from 30,000 feet, we'll say first that, that we, we kind of chose Laban as, as an example of a, a business or an enterprise, as we'll see what Laban had, that, that kind of went boom, boom and bust and, uh, and, and why that might happen. So I hope, hope you find that interesting. I know that we did. So the, the, the backstory on, on Laban, we, we find him uh, first in Genesis 24 as the servant of Abraham is going to find Isaac a wife and we're introduced to Laban's family. And, uh, and so Laban is, is introduced to us there as the brother of Rebecca. And as that servant takes Rebecca back to be Isaac's wife, just to kind of, again, put you in the time and the place where we are, um, Laban's sister is the, is the wife of Isaac. And we know about Isaac and Rebecca. So we're in this, we're in this time in, in history, uh, in the book of Genesis, kind of between the flood and the Exodus. And so it kind of, that's where we're, we're placing all of this. And, and, you know, in, in the time of, uh, the, the law of Moses not yet established and God's still speaking kind of the patriarchs and we'll, and we'll learn, we'll, we'll learn later in, in, in Laban's life that, you know, he, he, although in our minds, maybe we relate to him, well, he's, he's Rebecca's husband, excuse me, he's Rebecca's brother. And he's, he, you know, tangentially kind of here in, in Abraham's story, he must be a, a godly, a guy, a follower of Jehovah, and we find that's not the case. You know, he, he speaks of, of divination, and we know that he's got uh, household gods in, in his in his family, and and so what we're not here talking about a uh, necessarily a, a, a godly person or, or a follower of Yahweh. Uh, so again, the the servant of Abraham takes takes Rebecca away, and and you move on in your in your uh, Old Testament history, uh, a generation and several chapters later. Jacob is, uh, he has to skip town because he's done some, some uh, shady dealings of his own. <laughs> um, and he's angered his brother Esau and it's time for him to leave town and find a wife at the same time. And so in that combination of, of needs, uh, his, he is uh, told that the, the place to go is back to the land of his people. And then in the, uh, uh, the, the he, he, not to get a wife among the Canaanites, but, but to go back uh, to the land where his his father and mother are from, and so he he goes back to this country, and who does he run into? Just by coincidence and providence, is 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 Laban, and so Laban now uh, is is Jacob's uncle. Remember, Jacob is the son of Isaac and Rebekah, and uh, and so he has run into Uncle Laban, and um, we again, if you remember the story, uh, he he meets uh, Rachel, one of the daughters of Laban. <clears throat> falls in love at first sight and agrees to work seven years um, to, uh, to have her uh, as his wife. And we learn in the text that 
you know, Laban's uh, shepherding farming enterprise was not necessarily going great when Jacob arrived. Um, it, it, there's some indication that he was struggling a little bit. Jacob says that, that Laban didn't have much when he arrived. We know that it's not the servants that Jacob runs into um, that's taking care of the sheep when he arrives. It's Laban's own daughter is out doing the work. Um, so there's some indications that Laban is kind of a, uh, he's just getting by um, when, 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 Jacob get, when Jacob arrives. Jacob does work seven years, uh, and, 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 and uh, as we know the story, Laban, uh, by, uh, I don't, by deceit, um, offers his older daughter Leah as Jacob's wife, and Jacob has, uh, through negotiation, has to work another seven years um, for, for, the, for the wife. Uh, Is this the first Rachel. recorded account of a bait and switch? <laughs> so there is there is a business principle we were gonna we're going to get to about you know are we going to be trustworthy about what we say that our salaries and wages are uh but obviously laban was not and he, he deceived jacob and so 14 years uh jacob works and his compensation is two wives and then the last six years of his employment so we're 14 years in jacob is about to leave and laban says hey don't leave tell me what you want and, we get this 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 kind of complex tale about Jacob says, "Hey, I'll just I'll just take all of your uh, all your speckled e goats and your speckled e sheep," and uh, that's an animal husbandry term, speckled e. And, <laughs> and 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 so Laban says, "Hey, you've been good to me. Uh, I'll tell you what, all the speckled ones you can have them." And, and, but at the same time, he takes all the speckled ones and sequesters them where, where Jacob can't breed them. And so, you know, Laban is actively trying to, to undercut Jacob uh, in what he can do, obviously through Providence and through, you know, I don't know, uh, Mendel, <laughs> Mendel uh, use of uh, Mendel's Punnett square of genetics. I don't know how <laughs> Jacob was able to, to, to work out how to, how to breed uh, speckled goats and sheep. But we learned that Jacob greatly grew this flock of speckled goats and sheep. And so the, the, the business part of this is when Jacob arrived, Laban was not doing great. Through this 20 years, we know that Jake, uh, Laban increased, um, that, that he, he began to do very well. <clears throat> There's references to that throughout the text. And Jacob and Laban himself say that I've done very well during this 20 years that Jacob was there. And yet we get to the end of this 20 years and, and again, through Providence and God being with Jacob and, and Laban's deceit and, and uh, I don't know, maybe I don't, I don't think karma is a biblical principle, but you certainly kind of get some of this character's destiny kind of idea um, that, that Jacob has, you know, through this process of breeding the sheep and more and more of them being speckled, Jacob has grown his own, um, uh, assets and, and Laban's are now back to being somewhat depleted. And we see in chapter 31 and verse one, that Laban's own sons are saying, Hey, we can't keep this going on. Jacob's going to have every sheep we got. Um, and so we, we're back to this Laban, not having much. And, and Jacob ultimately leaves, um, uh, leaves in, under the, uh, you know, secretly, right. He, he this kind of clandestine under the departure cover of night. <laughs> under the cover of night. Um, because the, the relationship between Jacob and Laban has become so strained and, and so um, difficult, both, you know, both a family relationship and as a employment relationship has, has become so strained that he takes his own grandchildren and leaves um, under the cover of night. And so the, Laban is a cautionary tale. Um, we got this, we got this business person who has a, has a great employee and, just because of uh, the lack of godliness, honestly, in, in the way that he's treated over time, creates a, the relationship b becomes so poor, so adversarial, that he ends up losing his, his employee, his family, and a lot of his assets. Um, that, that's a, uh, anyway, that's probably more than you wanted on the background of Laban, but that's kind of the overview of the story um, on, on how, we, uh, how we get Laban from struggling to prospering 
And then at the end of the story, you know, kind of back where we started, he's back to square one. Yeah, one of the um, things I find most interesting, ironic, I don't know what I want to say um, there with, with that word, but, you know, Jacob's not really a great guy that believes in fair dealing himself, right? Proven. You know, uh, him <laughs> and his mama colluded to rob the birthright from Esau. Now, again, his mama, his mama Laban's sister, we might add. So right, his anyway. mama La Laban's sister, right? Um colluded to rob Esau. Now, Esau bears some blame. The New Testament text is very clear about that, about selling his birthright and all that. But there was some collusion that, that happened um, to make those things go down. So it's part of the reason why he's running off out of, you know, his initial home anyway. And mama says, hey, time to get you a, a wife. Let's go down there and get one about my people. And Jacob runs into, I think, what could be constru construed as like the future version of himself, right? This is the path you're on, kid. You keep going down this this road, and this is who you're going to end up as is is this guy. Um, so I think there's some lessons there um, that I've always found just kind of ironic um, of how bad that Laban is, and and Laban's a you know <laughs> that I think our current day term in vernacular would be a swindler. I mean, I, you know, from the day that that he lays eyes on Jacob, you know, he's looking to see how he can turn this kid, what he can get out of him. Um, you know, there's some commentators and some, you know, uh, if you go back to some of the Jewish history, uh, you know, they talk about how, you know, in the initial embrace that uh, what Laban was doing was feeling him up for any jewels that came from his sister or any, you know, monetary gifts that were coming his way. Um, and instead was, you know, disappointed that he was just another, you know, relative. Um, I'm convinced that, that Laban had no idea how well he was going to prosper for Jacob. I think he was just looking for some labor. Um, now, interesting here in the text, um, too, that early on, you've got Rachel and Leah both taking care of sheep. Um, but you got some sons later <laughs> that, that get involved. So I'm not sure if it's a age thing maybe the sons are young here and the daughters are having to take care of them or if it's you know the sons are sorry and they tried to get in on the enterprise later once it was making money i, I don't really know what what that full story is here but it says a lot that you know he's got these daughters out there that are publicly taking care of this stuff it says a lot about him that he's not the one doing it um and he's got the daughters out there doing it so as you know, Jacob, you know, comes to town here. He, he sees Rachel who, you know, is obviously must be very beautiful. And the fact that um, he sees her immediately goes over and kisses her and then weeps. Um, so that had to be something. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to speculate too much about that, but I mean, that's, that's an appearance. Strong um, reaction. Strong reaction. <laughs> strong reaction. Um and then they start negotiating, right? It's, you know, all right, how, how do I, you know, how do I work this out? And, you know, again, we, we talk about this a lot. It, it's hard to put our 21st century, century worldview back on this time, but understand we're in the time of dowries. You know, it, it's not Laban selling off his daughter was not, you know, the horrible thing here. The bait and switch is the horrible thing. Um, and then the other stuff, but, you know, this was a normal, um, deal here there's a dowry that that would be paid and you know obviously Jacob ran off from his house he didn't have any cash on him so he's he's paying in labor and so yeah. they agree to the the terms of employment is what we would say he he extended him an employment offer uh and that's when things started to get sideways yeah so the the first you know if you want to, if you want to kind of list Laban's shortfalls or or where where did as a business person what mistakes did did laban make and i think you already highlighted there's no good guys in this story necessarily jacob is i mean his name literally means he's a cheater and and uh you know we find out later that rachel is a thief and I mean, there's no good guys there's no this what makes some of these old testament stories difficult is there's not necessarily a good guy but here's the mistakes of laban the the first one as you note, is he was not honest about uh, the wages that he was going to pay uh, to to Jacob, and 
not not don't necessarily have to restrict that to the switching of Leah and Rachel because we learn later uh, Jacob says in chapter 31 that you have changed my wages 10 times so I, I think that there are other uh, instances that that we are not necessarily aware of in it or, or listed in the text where Laban has done similar things made promises that he didn't follow up on or change the terms of the agreement and um, you know so there's definitely part of the story here just about changing or withholding wages. That is, you know, talk about things that the Bible is very clear about. The Bible is very clear about um, withholding or changing wages to em employees or, or servants. Uh, give you a couple of examples. Leviticus 19.13, you shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant will not remain with you all night until the morning. Don't hold them. Don't even hold them overnight pay the same day a uh, person has, has earned um, what what they what they have uh, worked for. Uh, James 5 verse 4 New Testament, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields who you kept back by fraud are crying out against you and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. So again a New Testament example of almost exactly what what we're, we're talking about that wages kept back by fraud. Don't oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy. Give him his wages the same day before the sun sets, lest he cry out against you and you be guilty of the sin. Uh, don't muzzle the ox when it treads out the grain. I mean, all of those biblical principles say don't don't be don't be messing around with somebody's pay. Um, let, that's pretty let's, clear. Let's let's give a disclosure disclaimer here. All right, we're not talking about, and we're not saying by any stretch of the imagination that. Um, you know, in a corporate restructure, in a, you know, in, in difficult times that you don't go to employees and say, look, you know, it may, we may have to do across the board, a reduction of salaries because we can't afford it. Okay. Th that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about downsizing. We're not talking about having to lay people off. We're not talking about that. Here's what we're talking about is you promise to pay Joe employee, you know, $10 an hour for 40 hours worth of work. All right. And when Joe comes to get his check, you give him $50 and act like, well, that's all we can do. No. Right. I mean, I mean, it, it's not about necessarily changing pay. It's changing pay after the work is done. It's if you agree, I'm going to pay you to do a certain job for a certain amount of time. That's one thing. If you have to renegotiate or restructure that contract, that's completely different than yeah. saying you owe me Rachel and we, Le I got Leah. I woke up with Leah. I, yeah, that, that's that's a different story. Yeah, so changing prospectively as as opposed to retrospectively is a huge difference. I mean, we may have to have real difficult conversations about about you know what um, what the company can afford and what pay is is reasonable for the for the job. And you know, going forward, we we may have to have those conversations. But saying, hey, this times are tough, and so you know, for the last two weeks. That you've already worked, um, we we had to cut your pay in half. That is that that is unreasonable. That's that that would fall into this into this unfair and unfair bucket. And 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 it's you know it's just an honesty thing here. I think at, at core is that when when you have these um, conversations and negotiations about salary, which which coincidentally are probably my least favorite conversations in the workplace. Um, is, you know, can you, how honest are you going to be about it? And, and, and I would even, you know, leave the trail here briefly for just a minute, but, but I would even say that, you know, th there's, there's some culpability, there's some responsibility for, for, for managers or people who are, are in this position to pay salaries of, of painting an overly rosy picture of what, incentives might be available if they're really not ever intended to be paid you know so right. oh you know there's this future where you could be promoted into this position here there's a there's a future where you could earn this bonus if we hit these targets knowing that those aren't ever really realistic right. um that's that is not too far a stretch from from uh from labor Right. And, and, and I think that, that that's part of the deal, too, that, that we have to the, the business principle. Let's so let me circle back a little bit. Business principle number one is honest and fair dealings in compensation. 
when you are not honest and fair in compensation, it will come back to destroy your company every time. One, it's it's a sin as the verses that Michael um, read from and, and, and kind of demonstrated there. But two, just just as, as we're going to see, that was the ultimate downfall of Laban's whole enterprise is is about, you know, he constantly jacked Jacob around on compensation. And, you know, again, we're honest and fair dealings are, you know, saying, look, I, you know, we've got to make a change because the company's in hard times. Our corporate profits fell by 40% last year. Everybody's going to take a 10% pay cut next year. We're not going to go back and ask you to write a check for 10% of the money that we paid you. We're not going to dock your last paycheck. That's completely different. One, you know, nowadays, I don't know you could do it from an HR standpoint um, at, at any company, but there's, I'm sure there's, there's other ways, you know, as Michael alluded to, you know, painting overly rosy ideas, you know, yeah, hey, you know, good news here is, you know, on our incentive plan, it's uncapped. You know, we can make, you can make double your salary. Well, yeah, if, you know, we doubled the size of the corporation, but none of those things are likely to happen. Uh, you know, and, and I think sometimes managers in when they're trying to recruit talent, oftentimes we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll oversell um, w- what the expectations truly are. And, you know, that that's to me when you get off, uh, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm in a sales manager. I deal with sales guys all the time that that's what they do for a living is oversell stuff. But to me, the principle, the, the where this principle has come um, throughout the course of my career, very clear is that if you get off on the wrong foot with your employee, with compensation, it doesn't matter how good a boss you are or how good of an employee they are, that relationship will end badly because they feel every time that you've been unjust with them and they're just looking for a way out and a way to hurt you on the way out, a way to either take assets from the corporation, take clients, take business, turn people against you. When that relationship goes sour it is a bad deal every single time and it you know as you note those those consequences are often you know down the road a little bit Mm -hmm. and so this this is one of those things that that doesn't doesn't get you right away you know again if you paint that overly rosy picture of the progression of somebody's business career and the the uh, uh, opportunities for advancement that are out there and you know they're not real that doesn't become a problem until years down the road when those when those things haven't happened mm-hmm. and then there's there's that embitterment and there's resentment and and the the, the uh, relationship gets difficult and as you note um it could go badly in any number of ways from that point and so you know this having the hard conversation uh, as as in so many instances in life having the hard conversation up front of, hey, look, we know that this may this may keep you from working here, but here's the realistic um, opportunities that are going to be out there in the next few years. Having that having that honest conversation avoids those things down the road. Laban refused to have that honest conversation with with Jacob. Says, listen, you can have Rachel eventually, but <laughs> you're going to get Leah first, and and I don't know if if Jacob hangs around for that or not. Uh, but the 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 deterioration of the relationship between Jacob and Laban obviously begins with that. Uh, when you know, we're told the first seven years went by quickly. He was so, he was so looking forward to marrying Rachel. that says the first seven years passed quickly. I, I bet Jacob was a model employee. The relationship was probably good for those first seven years until Laban kind of made that first, um, yeah, that, 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 yeah, that's, that the te- that's the text I was looking for. So Genesis 30, <laughs> verse 20. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seem to be but a few days because of the love he had for her. I mean, this guy's whistling when he comes in. I mean, he's mm. happy as he can mm. be. Um, let's see where – and I'm skipping down. Da-da-da-da-da. Why have you deceived me younger before the firstborn? No, I just, yeah, there, it's, it's not there. I, I thought there was something about the, the difficulty of it, but he just served her for another seven years. But it sounds like, you know, again, this something to be, I'm sure to be debated, but you know, if I'm reading that text right, uh, 
looks like he he got Rachel up front yes. this time. He got his compensation up front as opposed yes. to waiting until the end of the seven years. Yes, uh, I think that I think that's accurate. I think there were two weddings there after seven years, and then seven more years. <clears throat> he was in he was in debt one wife uh, for the next working working that debt. He's off making for the next. payments on the second. I, I don't, yes, for, I, the I don't seven, <laughs> for the next seven years. Uh, so, so he, you know, it helped Jacob's negotiation skills. Anyway, he he negotiated a little better on the second wife. So, okay, the so that first that first principle is just about honest and fair dealings and, and dealing with dealing with employees. The second one I'd like to bring up is is also from chapter thirty, and and this is after fourteen years, Jacob has been a fourteen year employee. Now think about that. That that is a um, that's a pretty tenured employee at this point, <clears throat> a 14 year worker in Laban's fields. And Jacob notes, um, that he's worked 14 years and really he doesn't have anything as far as assets. You know, he's got wives and children, but he, everything that he has accumulated at this point has been for Laban and Laban has done well. He's a tenant farmer. We would call him. <laughs> and so, and so he asked to asks to leave in, in kind of verse 25 through 30 and, Laban says, "Hey, no, we've done well together, um, which is something that smarmy <laughs> Laban would say, right? We 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 work well together, and Laban knows on the backside of that he's the one that's that's receiving all of the gain of that. Um, and he says, so what? You, you name whatever you want, and I'll give it to you.' And Jacob says, "Well, I'll tell you what, just give me all the speckledy goats, and we've already talked about that. And so Laban says." Perfect. Verse 34. Good. Let it be as you say. And then verse 35. Don't skip over verse 35 of chapter 30. This is this is this is important to the character of Laban. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, everyone that had white on it, and every black lamb, and put them in charge of his sons and set them three days' journey from Jacob. And Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. So a couple of things. Laban's no dummy. Laban understands enough about um, genetics that that he knows. Look, if I'm going to give if I'm going to give Jacob all of the uh, speckledy goats and sheep, if I just sequester those and don't let them breed with with Jacob's sheep, and Jacob does well with what he's got, but if he's only got the pure white sheep and the pure colored goats, um, I can limit his uh, accumulation. That is his, that's the whole point of verses 35 and 36 is I've made this promise to Jacob. Now, how can I squelch on it? Yeah. In, in, in the risk management world, we would say we would limit his exposure to that loss. <laughs> risk, risk mitigation, <laughs> risk mitigation right there. We're going to limit the exposure to that potential loss. <clears throat> and so, and so what is he really doing? So what, what Laban is really doing is he has made an agreement again, uh, kind of a, an employment contract with Jacob for his wages. And he is trying very hard to win that negotiation to, uh, to set up the terms of the agreement in his favor, where he can um, put Jacob at a severe disadvantage. I think, I think we're back to a, to a trust thing here. And, and Jacob obviously figured out what Laban was doing, but Laban you know, but because of his greed, uh, because of his uh, just untrustworthy nature, I mean, and again, he's he's changing the the rules of the game. He's changing the parameters of the playing field to disadvantage Jacob um, in, in this deal that Jacob has made. Now, obviously, we see in the, the rest of that chapter through Providence and, and Jacob's ingenuity that that Jacob continues to to prosper and his his speckled goat herd continues to grow but man that is that is so shady what, what Laban does there in chapter 30 in making the deal with Jacob and then behind his back trying to sequester all of the all the speckled sheep I just think that that says everything you need to know about the character of of Laban and as we've said many times character is destiny and um continues to do things that are untrustworthy the, the relationship between the two of them continues to deteriorate. And ultimately we see he loses not only his best employee, but most of his family and a lot of his assets. 
so I'll, I'll shit, I'll set you up for a, uh, a shameless plug for a team modern quote, because this is one of the ones I love. So what, what, what's the, what's the team modern quote on uh, winning and negotiations? A deal is not a good deal unless it's a good deal for both parties. Uh, that, that's exactly right. And, and I think that's the principle here. Laban went into this deal trying to screw over Jake. I mean, it, it, it wasn't that it was going to be a good deal. Listen, there's plenty enough to go around here that both could have won. You know, that, that it's, you know, we talk about it being a win win proposition that, hey, you know, you get these ones, I'll get these ones, we'll grow them both over time, you take your cut, and, you know, off we go. Um, but Laban had no interest ever in being fair or being straight up. Um, and so because of that, you know, you end up creating an adversarial relationship with your employee that, that when you don't want to deal fairly with them, when you are seeking to win just for the corporation that, you know, corporations, I, I think, are, are hysterical um, in, in this way is that there are several that don't understand that it's the people is what makes your corporation successful, right? You know, uh, that, you know, whether we're looking at, at, at Team Modern, you, you know, your success is because you have a bunch of successful people that work for you, right? The bank that I work for, our success is because we have very good people that work for us. But if you get rid of those good people, the corporation stops being successful. I mean, it's just very simple that way. And while in our, especially 21st century world, we have bought into the idea that every employee is replaceable. Everybody's, ah, we'll just find another one. Well, it's true. You, you can replace any employee that you lose, but you may not be able to replace the same quality, right? We can find another sales guy. I don't know if he's going to be as good as the last one or not, but we can find another one for sure. There's plenty of people out there, but we also have to understand that there's a reason why we lose these people. If I'm not going to be fair with the first sales guy and I'm not going to be fair with the second one, how long before everybody knows I'm the guy that screws people? I'm the guy that's going to get over on you. And then who comes to work? I mean, and, and we're, we're not talking about even the days of, uh, you know, we've got glass door and all this other stuff that you can, you know, leave feedback on employers. They're in a small town. Don't you think everybody in town knows exactly what's happened with Jacob and the wedding feast and the 10 times his wages got changed. And now this speckled store, I mean, who's coming to work for Laban at this point? Um, you know, is he going to have to trick some other relative that comes in? But that's also probably why Laban was on hard times. And, and I think the reputation, too, in town is, Laban, you were out before the kid shows up. Kid shows up, you dupe the kid multiple times, and yet you're prospering here. But it's all because of the kid. And then, you know, obviously, once, once Jacob runs off uh, in the middle of the night, then we see, you know, Laban kind of blend back into – obscurity um there, there's a there's another side point i want to i want to make here and, and i don't know if this is one of our our main points or just just an aside but i think um i'm careful as exactly how i want to say this but that we have to understand that those that we employ when when we especially at the top of the house make these decisions begin to believe that those things are okay and the principles are okay I think we see this Rachel now because of the way that she saw her father deal thinks it's okay to then rob her father on the way out the door, right? They go out in the middle of the night. Again, the story, um, for those of you unfamiliar, when they flee in the middle of the night, Rachel goes and steals all of the father's household idols and takes them with them. And I'm half convinced that the reason that they get ran down is not really because they're leaving under the cover of darkness, but because they've stolen the household idols. So there's a couple of things there. Um, if you read commentators, one is um, there was a belief that the household idols are what brought the providence and what brought the wealth and all of that. So, so maybe he thinks that's the case that if she takes the idols, then that's the end of their good. Um, maybe it's that. The other one that I find more likely, uh, especially given how Rachel was raised, is that whoever possessed said household idols also possessed the inheritance. And I have a feeling that Rachel was lining up to be able to come back and claim whatever was left there at the end, especially from brothers that didn't work nearly as hard as she did. So just kind of an aside there that, that here 
your own daughter who watched you while in scheme now has decided that it's okay to do the exact same thing to you. So we've got to be careful about what we're turning our enterprise into. When the guys at the top are screwing people over, your middle managers are too. And, and then it's just going to follow down the org chart till it becomes, that's just who we are. You know, we are, you know, greedy and conniving and we'll cut anybody for a dollar. I think, I think the term that you're, you're uh, grappling for there is culture. Um, <laughs> Why do I have such a hard time with that term? <laughs> I mean, you, Laban had a, had a culture of mistrust and, uh, let's let's just try to outdo and connive one another in his in his kind of organization to the point that you remember when when Jacob went to to Laban's own daughters and said I think we need to leave town here and this is Laban's own daughters and the daughters respond in chapter 31 and said there's no there's no inheritance left to us in this house we are regarded as foreigners he sold us and now he has devoured our money all the wealth that God has taken from our father belongs to us and to our children. Let's, let's get out of here. Um, that that's, that's pretty phenomenal. Um, and, and where did that all come from? I would argue that it all came from this attitude that Laban was trying to, at the expense of someone else, win every negotiation. And that, that thought of a deal has got to be good for both sides. Um, I'm not sure you can say that's a biblical principle, but that idea of fair dealing um, and and worrying about the other person's outcome is, I, I think, I think very reasonable um, uh, that 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 kind of concern matters. Well, and and I think that you know that that biblical principle of rejoicing with those who rejoice, we should celebrate the successes of others. You know, right? I, I want the top salesperson in the country working for my company because that means we're reaping the benefits of those things. But I, I think the also, you know, just before that, um, at the beginning of chapter 30, 31, now Jacob heard the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that our, was our father's and from our father's he has gained all his wealth. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with the favor as he did before. So, I mean, this whole crazy, um, line of thinking that that Laban and the sons got down of you know Jacob's doing better than us and you know even though we've robbed him multiple times <laughs> Jacob's doing better than us and you know forget him and you know that you know instead of celebrating your top guy that's bringing in a ton of business beginning to look at them differently you know, again, that that speaks to that culture of, of mistrust, of, you know, of greed, of jealousy, of, of, of all of those bad at attributes that destroy companies. And so we've got to be very careful, kind of to our last point here that we want to make is that, that that greed and jealousy and envy, when that gets in the bloodstream of the corporation, uh, it, it spells disaster. I mean, I, all these guys, instead of saying, Instead of being, and again, it's skewed perspective, right? Instead of being honest and saying, like we had, you know, 10 verses ago, Laban didn't have Jack before, you know, Jacob showed up. Now they're all wealthy. They're all eaten. And it's, uh, Jacob's doing too good. <laughs> I mean, th th think about how crazy that is. Never mind how much our wealth is greatly expanded. Jacob over here is eating too good because he should eat less somehow, even though he's the reason for our success. So instead of celebrating the successes and having a culture that celebrates the successes of our employees and rewards them for that, and, and those rewards, quite honestly, in, in, in my career, are not just financial. And, and sometimes, you know, the financial rewards aren't as big as the recognition of the, you know, saying uh, of the statements of the communications going out to the whole team of how great a job they did. That, you know, encouragement goes, you know, a, a long way too in helping that employee morale, uh, echoing the comments of, of what we believe in and encouraging others to do the same. Yeah. I mean, uh, who is shocked, shocked that Laban didn't regard him with favor as before, <laughs> you know, Hey, those, those 14 years that Jacob was, all he was doing was increasing Laban's assets. <laughs> Laban was pretty, 
pretty pleased. And then all of a sudden, Jacob starts accumulating some wealth of his own. And chapter 31, verse 2, Laban did not regard him with favor as before. I just think that is that is subtly hilarious that that now that now that he's actually being compensated for his labor, that that Laban doesn't regard him with favor. He's um, eating too good. <laughs> yeah. So the 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 last the last point I would make about the greed of Laban, and this, you know, we've we've touched on the greed and how that permeates the, the culture of the organization. But in, in chapter 31, verses 38 and 39, as Jacob kind of gives this um, exit interview <laughs> with, with Laban about why he's leaving, really interesting comment he makes here in, in verses 38 and 39. Here's what Jacob says after he's, after Laban get, tracks him down, <laughs> he sneaks off in the middle of the night, Laban tracks him down. And Jacob says this, these 20 years I have been with you, your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, and I have not eaten rams from your flocks. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. I think that gives us another insight into, into how Laban uh, ran his organization and how he viewed Jacob, is that his greed said, Hey, Jacob, if we, if we lose an animal here, if there's any corporate loss, if there's any shrink, whether it's, it's your fault you. or not, whether it's your fault or not, it's coming out of your check. Uh -huh. um, that is, that is it's just another, I think it's just another glimpse and in insight into how Laban viewed his enterprise. And, and, and I think, you know, kind of as we start to wrap up here, one of the things I think is interesting about Laban is Laban is not, he's not, evil as we would typically define evil in the Bible, right? We don't, we don't see him, uh, we don't see him murdering, killing, killing anybody. children. Yeah. 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 We're not, we don't see him trying to overthrow governments and, and kill Kings. And he's not, he's not murderous. And he's not sacrificing his children to Baal. And, you know, and yet he is, he is exactly the, just the kind of banal everyday evil that we probably see a lot of in our current world, you know, greed, um, out to get, thinks everybody's out to get him out to get others, um, and selfish and, and ultimately unsuccessful. I mean, I just think that, I think that is pretty common. Um, by the way, and just kind of another principle here is the people who are, least trustworthy are the ones that are most paranoid. I think that is almost, <laughs> I think that's almost yes. universally true mm. is that, 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 that people who are most paranoid are the people who are most likely to be cheating somebody else because they, they, they see it in themselves and they expect everybody else to be you know, operating the same way. And we see that in Laban also. Mm. Um, but just kind of his, you know, the, just kind of the everyday evil of greed and selfishness that, that brings down Laban I, I, I think that I relate a lot more to that than I, than I do with somebody who's out, you know, murdering and overthrowing governments that, that that's obviously evil. That's a, that's a little bit removed from my life. Yeah. I, I see a lot of Laban's out there. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, in our current corporate culture and society, I mean, how many do we hear about the, you know, tech companies that take off because of somebody's idea and then the founder gets fired. The guy with the idea gets ousted. Um, you know, we, we hear about this stuff. It, it you know, it, it definitely happens today. But I think as as we're learning about how to be better in business, I think we've got to just watch ourselves for this. I mean, am I following the same path? I mean, uh, am I falling into these traps? And then, you know, self-actualizing it as oh this is just part of corporate the corporate world this is just corporate america this is just what we do just um, business just business it's not yeah nothing personal it's just business um when i start to fall into those traps when i when i begin down that path that's when you know we need to do some soul searching and we need to see that you know and, and remember you know the, the beautiful thing about the scriptures is we also have the end of the story where, where laban becomes another obscure character and loses everything right um we should expect the same. When we walk down these paths, we should expect, if not now, then at some point, all of this will come back. You know, the, the biblical principle that you reap what you sow 
is proven over and over and over and over again, not only throughout the scriptures, but throughout all of our lives, we reap, we will reap what we sow. And when we sow dishonesty and evil gain, um, then, you know, it's going to come back to us and it's going to come back, you know, generally tenfold, uh, when, when we do others wrong, um, that that's that's the only place I'll uh, I'll throw in Michael throughout the the idea of karma. I don't, I don't know that karma is necessarily a biblical principle, um, but you reap what you sow. One hundred percent is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and because of that, and because God's um, time frame is a little different than ours, we always need to be careful identifying who's getting. You know, they must be blessed by God. We've talked about that before. Mm-hmm. You know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust for a little while. And you could, you could have easily looked at, at Laban in the middle of that 20 year period with Jacob and said, look, I mean, this guy's prospering. His flocks are doing well. He's, he's got great employees. Um, God must be blessing him. And in reality, we know that the foundations of everything he had was crumbling underneath him because of, because of his lack of character. And so, um, it's hard, it's hard to identify that from the outside. Yeah. Um, And and I think that's part of it too, is, is, is understanding, you know, with us and having the humility to say, you know, is, is God blessing me or is God blessing Joe over in the accounting department or, you know, Bob and sales. Cause, cause if it's that, then, you know, we need to understand, you know, I, again, I, the, the country saying where our bread's buttered, you know, I, we got to understand where that's coming from. And maybe it's because we got a superstar um, or we got somebody that that's just really, you know, doing a good job for us. And, and we got to rally behind that as opposed to looking at that with envy and greed and, you know, uh, trying to figure out how we can get, you know, maximum dollar out of them for minimum wage. Um, yes. you know, that, that, that's where we get into problems. Man, the contrast between Boaz, who we studied last week mm-hmm. and, and Laban, I mean, it, it, as extraordinary. I'm, I'm, I've never studied them back to back until we kind of undertook this, but it is, I mean, it is stark. I mean, it is jarring. It, it's and, and just obvious the, 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 the distinctions between those two guys and their own recognition of where their success came from just could not be more stark. Yeah. I mean, to me, the, the, the two verses of um, any losses are born by my hand because you required it from Laban and yes. boys get clumsy <laughs> from Boaz. Yes. I mean, just if there's not, you know, two well, verses that just scream this story better, I don't know what is. Well said, man, that, that's, that's your, that is exactly right. That is exactly right. And so again, if you think you reap what you sow, we see the end of that story. Laban, as you said, fades into obscurity and Boaz is the great grandfather of David. So something, something to be said there. Absolutely. Yeah. As, as we draw this to a close, we're going to um, keep burning into uh, next week and, and see how our next character is. Um, yeah, they're not all Boazes. Um, we'll be real honest with you. Laban definitely isn't. And, uh, we're, we're going to try to learn from both sides of this coin. I think it's, it's just as good to do an, an autopsy of the, uh, the bad ideas as the good ones. And hopefully we can learn, you know, what steps not to walk down, um, at not too long ago, um, and going through a, a marriage class. Um, I, I taught a class on, on Ahab and Jezebel of, of all the bad things in a marriage that you can get. Um, and I, stuff like that I, I, I find fascinating that if we can try to look at what those bad things are and while you know we would never want to call ourselves a Laban or an Ahab or a Jezebel you know sometimes we may have some of those attributes creep up in our lives and it, it's always good soul searching a little check to make sure we're not going down that path um, but thank you for tuning in thank you for being with us again if you have got characters you want us to discuss or you got some biblical principles that you see um, from a story and you'd like us to to bring it up please um, hit us in the comments or uh, text us or email us and we'd be happy to bring those up on the next call but uh, until next time thank you so much for being with us and uh, we look forward to more have a good day Mr. Ray. yeah buddy god bless